Hello, everybody. My name is Gerardo Navarrete. Welcome to a global GG event. Hello, everybody. My name is Gerardo Navarrete. Welcome to a I am a leader for GG Campeche from Mexico and also co-leader in Global GG. Welcome, everybody. Please make sure that you rub your Twitter handle, your contact, and where you are in our chat. Today, we have a great presentation about librarians as instructional partners. Advocating for school librarians and school libraries is not new. Across the United States, there are prominent voices that promote the urgent need for certified full-time librarians in every school across the country and advocate for the profession by showcasing the various aspects of the role of librarians. Today, Kim, Dali, and Christie, Daniel and Christie will be discussing the misunderstood role of librarians in the field of education, how librarians can support schools and what the research says about the educational benefits of a school librarians. So let's welcome first to Kim. Kim Brown has been the Media Center Director at North Reading High School in Massachusetts since 2011. She has been working in libraries since the seventh grade. Kim is a graduate of the University of New Hampshire and has a master's degree in library and information and science from Simons University. Her passions include lifelong learning and encouraging curiosity in students and teachers. Kim's educational philosophy is that there are no foolish questions. Asking questions indicates curiosity and a willingness to learn. Welcome, Kim. So let's welcome to Christy. Christy Schaumann Farrar is a consultant at the Massachusetts Library System, where she provides guidance and continuing education to library staff all over the state. Prior to working to MLS, Christy worked as a children's and teen library in Massachusetts public libraries for a decade and was the director of the school and public library division at a well-known library vendor. She has a master's degree in library and information and science from Simons University, as well as a master's in language, reading, tutor for the University of Arizona. Welcome, Christy. And we have two, Daniel with us. Daniel Masterson is the youth service librarian at the Wilmington Memorial Library in Massachusetts. She's a former middle school teacher and journalist. Daniel has been working in libraries since 2015, collaborating with librarians, teachers, business and community leaders. She has a master's in education from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and a broadcast journalism degree from Boston University. So welcome, ladies. We are really proud and happy to have you here now with us in Global DEG. So I don't have to make any more about your presentation. You are really awesome, and we will have a really, really great presentation with you. So let's do it. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Can we get our screen turned on? There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. So since Gerardo did our introductions, um, we really don't have to say a lot. Um, I will just tell you that I am a Massachusetts certified library media and instructional technology specialist. I am a Google for Education certified coach, Google for Education certified trainer, and recently uh, a Google Educator Group Massachusetts co-leader. Uh, I occasionally do online product and app reviews for ABC Clear School Library Connection. And in 2018, I was awarded the Massachusetts School Library Association's Super Librarian Award. 
Hi everyone, so um, I'm Danielle Masterson, and as Gerardo said, I'm the Youth Services Librarian at Wilmington Memorial Library. I come from a few different backgrounds. I was a journalist and also an educator, and now I am a librarian administrator and librarian. Um, I've graduated from Project SET, which was run through the Massachusetts library system, and I'm also considered a Beanstack expert and trainer, and I love doing these types of presentations and sharing knowledge with everyone. And hi, everyone. I, uh, my name is Christy, and as mentioned, I am a consultant for the Massachusetts Library System, which is, means that we support all the libraries in the state of Massachusetts, which even though we're a small state, there are 1,600 libraries here. Um, I also am an adjunct professor of children's literature at Salem State University and the co-host of the podcast, This Podcast is Overdue, which is about books and libraries and uh, learning. So on today's agenda, first we will be talking about uh, library educational standards. We'll talk about public librarians supporting schools, what the research says, and misconceptions, and what we do all day. So um, before we go into the library educational standards, I just want to talk for just a second about why we're here today. So over the years, I've uh, come to have uh, the understanding that a lot of people really don't understand the role of a librarian. And most recently, it occurred to me that as librarians, we all have a responsibility to speak up on behalf of our profession and that we can't rely on someone else to do that for us. Us. Um, I don't want to go any further without doing a shout out to two people who have really influenced me and are the reason why I actually ended up here today. And that would be um, Shannon Moore and Francis Cottom from Global Gag. Um, you two really pushed me outside of my comfort zone, like far, far <laughs> outside of my comfort zone and helped me to really find my voice. Um, I also want to do a shout out to uh, the rest of the people that were in the Global Gag Coach cohort too with me. I happened to look up and notice that um, Kelly is in the chat, not sure who else is there, but hello to everyone who's there. So um, let's uh, just talk for a second about this did you know slide. So as early as the year 2000, um, Massachusetts was doing research on the impact of school libraries on student achievement. And there was a study done by Dr. James C. Boffman, and he was uh, in charge of the, he was the director of the school library teacher program at Simmons College. And when I was there, um, it's not called Simmons University, but um, when I was there in 2005 attending graduate school, um, Dr. Boffman did something that was considered uh, very um, revolutionary. Uh, we were assigned as school library pre-service teachers to work on a collaborative lesson plan with students in the Master of Arts in Teaching program. Um, and that was unusual. That's not something that typically happens even today. Um, you know, I'd be interested in hearing from people in the chat, because uh, we will be looking at the chat later, um, how many of you as pre-service teachers did any kind of instructional planning during your school training with um, with you know pre-service librarians, I'd be really interested to to hear that. So um, the slide highlights the study from Dr. Bom Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Boffman. It also um, highlights um, an ongoing um, study by uh, Colorado State University where they gather um, school library impact studies. And most recently, a study by the Massachusetts, um, sorry, the Mass School Library Study, which sought to evaluate uh, public school library programs across the state and evaluate whether or not they were adequately serving the needs of students. Unfortunately, those results don't paint a good picture for Massachusetts in terms of equity and access, particularly in urban and rural districts, which serves to support, you know, 
um, informational webinars like this one that advocate for and inform school library administrators, educators, school support staff, and community members of the critical role of librarians as instructional partners. So let's start talking about some of those national library standards. So in, um, in 2007, AASL, which is the American Association of School Librarians, published a document titled Standards for the 21st Century Learner. And then in 2009, they published an additional program guideline that was entitled um, Empowering Learners. So over the years, uh, they came to realize that all of the standards for school librarians, for students, and for library programs really should be all in one place. So in 2018, they introduced the AASL uh, National School Library Standards. And um, they're integrated into six foundations, which you can see at the top of the chart. So those foundations are inquire, include, collaborate, curate, explore, and engage. And then um, on the left side, those verticals are uh, the key domains of think, create, share, and grow. And those are connected to the inquiry process undertaken during research, you know, whether it's student research, um, you know, teacher research, research, administrative research, just the research process in general. So um, basically to summarize, just like classroom teachers, librarians have curriculum standards that inform their instructional practices. And I don't think a lot of people really realize that. So many librarians will actually post these standards in their library and point out the standards being addressed if they're doing formal instruction. Um, so, you know, sometimes if I'm working with a class and it's a formal instruction, I will write all of the standards, you know, not all of them, but the key standards on the whiteboard and point them out to students and the person, the teacher who's in the room with me, just so that, you know, people realize that there are instructional standards. Um, and interestingly enough, some states, for example, Pennsylvania, um, have adopted the AASL standards as their state school library standards. Okay, so the next one, the future ready frameworks. So the future, um, probably most of you have heard of the future ready frameworks. So the future ready schools frameworks were established in 2015 with guidance from the Alliance for Excellent Education in Washington, DC. And basically what, um, what the idea was that district superintendents who joined the future ready schools network would pledge to, and I quote, implement, implement innovative learning practices to support teachers and students within their district. So in 2016, the Future Ready Librarians framework were, frameworks were established. So what you see in front of you yeah, are the Future Ready frameworks. So the, um, the Future Ready Schools frameworks has something that looks similar to this. Um, all of the things in those wedges are actually um, the different things that librarians do that focus on those frameworks that are embedded into future ready schools. So um, I'm just going to quote here. Future ready right librarians are building level innovators who believe in empowering learners with diverse skills and literacies, <laughs> collaborating with peers and leaders to promote innovative practices, ensuring equitable learning opportunities for all students. Future ready librarians lead beyond the library collaborating not only with teacher colleagues, but also with building and district leaders to prepare future ready learners. Creating exciting and dynamic opportunities for future ready learners required shared leadership among school leaders, including librarians, instructional coaches, principals, IT leaders, and district administrators. So like I said, all of the wedges in the chart um, highlight the actions that future ready librarians take to support student-centered learning. So those standards are also followed in school libraries. And finally, the ISTE standards. So the original ISTE standards for students were published in 1998. And um, this is probably the, the set of standards that most people are familiar with out of the, the three that I'm highlighting here. Um, and the standards have been updated and revised several times since then. And standards for specific educational roles have been established. 
So the visual in front of you actually shows the ISTE standards for coaches. And I selected the ISTE standard for coaches as opposed to the ISTE standards for educators because as librarians, we definitely tend to do coaching as part of our role. And I think, um, you know, in working with other Google certified educators, that was one of the missing pieces that, you know, I feel a lot of them didn't necessarily understand was that, you know, we are not only instructional leaders, but we are also coaches, even if we don't have that formal certification. So ASL has mapped out crosswalks that um, show you know, how the National School Library Standards and other sets of national teaching and learners standards, you know, all um, match up. So that's what I wanted to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kim. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we as public librarians can support classroom teachers in schools. Next. So during the pandemic, um, we've had to really pivot and try to come up with some new ways to support all of our classrooms and not just uh, educators, but also patrons and parents. So uh, as public librarians, we were critical to at-home learning and tried to provide support to everyone including uh, students. So what we came up with was uh, Kim and I worked very hard on a virtual library that was housed on the Flint Memorial Library website, which was my library during the pandemic. And we created resources that included public health updates, library services, and also educational help. A lot of times you may find yourself as a parent who is not a classroom teacher, just going on Google and trying to find anything that will go ahead and work for your lesson to help your student, but it may not be the best resource. So we were critical in trying to come up with ways to help you find appropriate resources. And because we had our buildings closed, we had to do that virtually. One of the things that I personally love as a librarian and as a former teacher is bringing the library to students. So during the regular school year, you'll see a lot of times public librarians, we love to visit and we love to go ahead and bring that library into your school and find ways to reach your students that way. Um, we may visit your classroom, we may visit your library, um, as you can see in this photo, this is a visit I did at North Reading Middle School where we had just done a library card drive and I brought a bunch of books to book talk to the students. Um, very often when uh, you think of public librarians helping educators, this is the kind of thing that you think about. But there's so much more. Uh, we can do a lot of educational support You'll see here that there's different ways that we can support you. Most commonly, uh, you'll use our online resources. You'll go ahead, you'll find our databases, which here in Massachusetts is provided by the state and we all have them. Um, but you'll also find that every library has a core group of databases and then there are additional databases that you your library may join. So at my current library, we have some additional eBooks and we also have things like National Geographic Kids. Uh, so you'll be able to find, again, reputable online resources through your library. And that's something that helps not just our patrons, but also our teachers. We do a lot of outreach. So you'll often think of, you know, the librarian is sitting there and they're talking about books and that's wonderful. And we certainly do do that. Uh, but we also do things like class visits and pop-up libraries. Now pop-up libraries is a new thing that's kind of come up over the last handful of years. It's taking the laptop and a cart of books and actually having the library software on your laptop. And then students can go ahead and they can take out the materials with you right there. So you don't need to be physically in the public library building. The public library can be in your building. So a lot of times what we try to do is come up with, as you saw in that last slide, um, those were a bunch of fiction books that I had brought to a grade six a classroom visit, but you can also have nonfiction to go along with a project. There's 
it, it's really endless what we can bring over as long as we have enough time to prepare to help people. Um, another one that we like to do is library card drives. And this one, uh, just with a little bit of planning and some prep work can be really, really successful. Um, one of my favorite library card drives was with a elementary school in North Reading where we gave permission slips and library card forms to every single first grader. And we picked them up. Within two weeks, we had all of the cards ready. And then I went and did a traditional story time with the kids, all based on having a library card. Uh, so that way, you know, we want to help you with your resources, but sometimes some of the resources, in order to help you, we, the kids need to have a public library card. <laughs> so that's why we we like to do these different drives and uh, so that they always have a barcode that has the public library uh, contact with them. Um, another thing that we like to do, to technology tutorials. Um, you may not be the most tech savvy and that's okay. We can come in and we can show everyone how to use the databases. Um, a lot of, especially youth service, librarians are very much, um, we're educators as well. So like Kim was saying, we like to coach, we like to educate, and we're able to do that with different uh, grade levels and especially on our own resources. Um, special events, you have a STEAM night coming up. We can go ahead and bring a pop-up library to STEAM night all steam books. And then, you know, the kids go ahead and they, they do their event and then they come out and they're so excited about science, technology, and they can pick up a book and bring it home. Um, I brought for one steam night, I think I brought a hundred books and probably only took home half of them, you know, so kids really, they, they get really excited about something and we can be there to go ahead and support you with it. Uh, programming. You know, a lot of people do know that we have all our programs and we like to do things. I have here um, math, science and scissors for crafting. Those are kind of, you know, the what everyone knows about us for programs. Uh, but we we have lots of different things for programs, whether it's storytelling for literacy. Um, you know, it can be a steam steam team. We have um, music programs. There's a lot of different things that uh, we do educationally for kids. And then uh, one final support that we offer a lot of times are assignment alerts. And this one is, you know, you have an assignment coming up. You're not sure what kind of um, resources you have physically in your building. Well, a public library is going to have access to, at least in my case, 36 libraries. And so if you know that you want to do a biography project, but you only have, you know, 10 different people's biographies, well, go ahead and ask your public library. They'll go, they'll then look and see what they have. And then they'll go and look at the other 35 libraries, put all of that together, and then uh, create a display and be able to help the students. So a lot of times, if you're, if you're listening to this and you're a teacher, and you're not sure how we can help you, don't worry, your librarian's on top of it and they will likely send you, we usually, we try not to do it the first week of school because we know everyone's busy, <laughs> but we might do it the second or third week of school. We might wait till October, but we're gonna send you something and tell you all of the different services that they personally can offer you as an educator. Um, I happened to do mine last week and I already got some, some hits from teachers who were like, wow, I didn't know you could do that. So if, if you don't hear from your librarian, go ahead and reach out to them, see if they offer some of these services, but more likely than not, you will hear from them probably by October. Great. So I'm gonna share a little bit about what the research says about librarians and students. <clears throat> Anecdotally, I can give you many examples of how school librarians are beneficial to student achievement, but we also have decades of educational research showing that access to school librarians and library programs has a positive impact on student lifelong learning. For example, a 2004 study looking at a California community college found that students from high schools with librarians and library programs achieved higher exam scores and final grades in a first year information research course than those from schools without a library and a librarian. 
A Pennsylvania study also identified longer term impacts on students' lifelong learning. What students learn is how to learn more effectively, both now and in the future. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's not just reading and writing and research skills. In a 2015 Washington State study, the presence of a certified school librarian was also a predictor of higher elementary and middle school math scores. In addition, newer studies conducted over the last several years show that strong school libraries are also linked to other important indicators of student success including graduation rates and mastery of academic standards. And all of um, the quotes from uh, research studies are gonna be in our resources at the end. So um, you can still get access to those slides. Okay, so not only do we have countless research studies talking about the positive impact of school librarians on student achievement, we also know that librarians working with teachers on instructions is beneficial. In my previous position before I was working at the Massachusetts Library System, I worked at EBSCO as the Director of School and Public Library Products. And in that role, I worked closely with the user research team, which was led by Kate Lawrence and Deirdre Costello, two amazing user researchers. They're actually both still out there, so if you can find them um, on Twitter, they're amazing. I had the pleasure of assisting with a large contextual inquiry study, which is an ethnographic research study, looking at how college students do research for academic assignments. Going in, the researchers assumed that library instruction during the freshman year of college would be an indicator of student confidence. But what they found was that it really was intentional instruction in high school that had the biggest impact. And it wasn't just the presence of a librarian that was important. Rather, when research training happened in partnership with a teacher and a school librarian, the impact was even greater. Sending students to the library to ask their media specialist questions wasn't as effective as having teachers and librarians working together to instill research skills. Mm -hmm. This could look like holding class sessions in the library for the course of a project, having a library co-teach lessons, or building content area projects around necessary research and critical thinking skills. But no matter ex the exact approach, the research is clear that classroom teachers and school librarians together make strong instructional partnerships that positively impact student achievement. And school librarians aren't just good for students, they're good for teachers too. Uh, librarians can save classroom teachers time and make their teaching more effective. So librarians can do pre-lesson research for teachers, helping them find supporting information and even helping them craft a lesson. Actually, that was something I always wanted to be able to do if I was a school librarian was like working at the very beginning of a lesson before it even got to the students because there's so much that librarians can offer in that space. Librarians can also effective, more effectively teach research skills, allowing classroom teachers the time to focus on subject area content instead of teaching kids how to do research. And librarians can identify key places and lessons where research and inf in information instruction will have the biggest impact, making student projects and learning more successful. And last but not least, librarians can curate resources for classroom use and instruction, like Danielle mentioned, with regard to assignment alerts and classroom visits. But no matter how you work with your school or public librarian, I encourage you to do so. So my challenge to you, is after today or maybe next week when you're back at work, reach out to a librarian and start the conversation. And if you don't have a librarian in your school, ask your administration why, and then share this talk with them. So now we're gonna kind of go over uh, what we do all day and some of those misconceptions <laughs> that are kind of the thorn in the librarian's sides. <laughs> so our next slide actually shows um, a um, word cloud of some of the different roles that librarians actually, um, you know, uh, some of the roles that we serve over the course of a typical day. So for those of you watching, I would love to hear in the chat, um, what roles most surprise you? Um, that would be awesome to, to know that. So, um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot today about ways that librarians are instructional partners, but what we haven't talked about is some of those misconceptions that people have about what we do. And I think probably for me, one of the biggest things that uh, frustrates me is uh, working with a class 
maybe multiple classes are in the media center. And it's a really bustling, loud, busy space, which I totally love. And I think most librarians will tell you that is their favorite time is when it's a bustling space. Students are all excited. They're interacting. They're collaborating. Um, so the bell rings the classes leave and suddenly there's a lull and somebody happens to come in right after that, hasn't seen any of what was going on before that and makes that comment, oh, it must be so nice to work in a quiet space like this all day. Mm -hmm. Yep. I had yep. someone come in one time and I was setting up story time and he walked in and he said, oh, it's, it's play time. And I said, no, it's early literacy story time. <laughs> and he was like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just meant that the kids would have fun. Um, but I think his first statement is probably what he thought that, you know, we just sit on the floor and play with little kids and not understanding that I not only have a master's degree in education, but I was certified in teaching, reading and being a reading specialist. So it's, you know, there's so much more to just, it, it's not just, it's not just playtime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of mine that, um, that I always hear, but, um, and it's actually two sides of, of the same coin. One is that the library is just books, that librarians only, we love books, obviously, we love reading, uh, most mm -hmm. of us do, and um, we want to share books with people, but the, the role of librarian is more, is beyond books. It is information, and that information can be Mm -hmm. as an article from a database, it can be a newspaper, it could be a TikTok video, um, that information comes in all different um, ways. And then on the other side of it is the comment that is, well, you know, everything's online now, we don't need books anymore. And mm -hmm. that's not true either, because we re it really is a balance between different types of media and where that information is best presented. And librarians mm -hmm. are great at being able to figure that out to help people meet their research and information needs. I think another thing, too, um, is the idea of librarians as um, the gatekeepers of information. Um, you know, as um, recent as last night on social media, I saw a post that alluded to librarians as gatekeepers of the books. And while, you know, I'm, I'm not here to criticize, you know, people that don't really understand our role. And I'm sure that that post was meant as a compliment, but the problem mm -hmm. with that is that we are not gatekeepers. We're resource, we, ugh, we are resource sharers. Um, you know, I kind of like to explain my role to people that don't understand as a resource matchmaker. You know, you come into the library, you tell us, you know, this is what I'm looking for. To find, or maybe they're not even sure. They have this vague idea in their brain. You know, this is something that I'm interested in and need to find information, but they haven't even really refined it. So our job is to kind of figure out, you know, what is that resource that's going to be helpful for them? And it may be, like Christy said, in different formats. You know, we may recommend a book, but we might recommend a YouTube video. We might recommend a database. You know, there's lots of things. And because of the position that we're in, we have an understanding of all of those places where the information lies. And we're not there to gatekeep. We're there to share and kind of connect people, you know, like a matchmaker. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And libraries are also educators. They're teachers, especially the ones who are working in school libraries. Um, and, you know, uh, Danielle, you mentioned that in your section, too, that, you know, we want to be able to educate. Um, and not only do we sh want to give and share the information and be, you know, pushing it out there to you, but also to show you how to do it yourself um, and be able to find that information. Mm -hmm. So Danielle, something that um, I'd like for you to talk about, um, not to put you on the spot, but um, you know, during, during the pandemic, the um, the um, book matchmaking thing that you did. Can you talk a little bit about that because that was fabulous. Oh, thank you. Yes, of course. So um, during the pandemic, and actually we still do it now at my current library. Uh, it's not used as much as during the pandemic, but what we did was pull together a Google form and it just had in there, you know, the child's age and some, uh, the different levels of the book. So what they would do is go through 
um, go through the list and put age. And then is it, um, are you looking for uh, which level of book, whether it was early reader or a fiction book, nonfiction? And during the pandemic, what we had was a long list of categories and kids could pick those. Uh, we tried to limit it to five categories and understand that you get between five to 10 books. And then that way um, they could pick, you know, I love unicorns, but I also love dragons and I love puppies. And so you could go ahead and as a librarian, we would pick. And we also had librarian's choice, which was really nice to see it was picked a lot. <laughs> so we knew that our patrons were appreciating that. We knew them well enough to be able to choose a book. Uh, so that was the traditional book bundle program, but we also did a just write book program. And for that, what they would do is go through, and that was much more of almost a reading specialist advisory where we would say, you know, I'm in grade two, but I'm a very early reader or I'm in grade two, but I'm a very high reader. And so as they chose their different levels, it then went into the different books that we thought they would like um, based on their reading level. So um, that was much more built for the schools so that teachers could direct kids there. But then the other one was more of an at home, you know, parents looking at it and going like, I don't know what level my kid's reading at, but at least this way, I know my, my child loves unicorns. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was the traditional book bundle for patrons and then also just write books, which was more of an educational tool. And then because it was in the pandemic, what we would do is put the books in a little brown bag, drop them downstairs and people could come in without um, having, having to have contact with any of us. Mm -hmm. Christy, oh, do awesome. you want to yeah. talk about data analyst a little bit? Um, sure. I, I think that Danielle, since she's in the library, does that a little bit more, but I do as well in my role um, in that, you know, we are interacting with research all the time, but we also think a lot about how people are interacting with what we have. And that looks mm -hmm. like data, a lot of spreadsheets. Um, sometimes it's, you know, how many times has somebody used a database and whether or not we, we have are providing the right types of um, information um, through our um, database offerings. Sometimes it's, you know, um, what kind of feedback are we getting from the programming that we're doing um, or the books that we're selecting. But then there's a lot of analysis on the collection itself. You know, we were talking about resources um, more on kind of an individual person need level, but librarians are often also looking at the, the whole, the, the big collection as a whole, both the print collection and mm -hmm. the, the um, digital collection. And what does that look like? Um, making sure that there's enough in each area that people, subject area that people need, um, making sure that none of it's too old. Um, there's a lot, mm -hmm. lot these days also on um, analyzing collections with an equity lens and making sure that there's a diverse um, array of perspectives um, presented so that it's not just a collection that represents one perspective. And so all of that requires data analytical skills and um, a lot of, of big kind of aggregate um, thinking um, beyond just the the one-to-one -one resource matchmaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of times people probably don't realize, but at a certain level, you might spend every, you know, Friday morning with spreadsheets and, you know, you will wind up going through them and you're trying to see, you know, let's analyze what books are going out. Is it the young chapter books that are most popular? Okay. Then I need to buy some more young chapter books. Mm -hmm. You know, are my, um, is my higher grade elementary fiction not really going out? Okay. Well, let's move some of that money over and over. So, you know, there's a lot of analyzing that has to get done and, I think people would be surprised to know how much data is that you do have to analyze in a, in a library. Mm -hmm. So before we uh, open it up to questions, um, I'm just curious, have either of you ever been in the position where you have hidden books in the trash that you were taking out of the collection because of the fear that people were going to say, you know, what are you doing? Throwing away all of these perfectly good books. Have either of you ever been in that situation? 
I haven't had that exact. Yeah, often I um I would take book covers off. This is this sounds terrible and controversial, but when when it comes to weeding, which is what the term we use for taking books out of the collection, kind of if you think about a garden, you weed the garden of the things that are not helping the garden grow. Um, when you're taking books out of that collection, a lot of time it's because the content is out of date or it's inaccurate. I mean, you know, we don't want computer books that were published in 1980. Uh, before the internet was widely available. Uh, we need to take those out and we don't want to give them away. We don't want to sell them. We don't want those books to show up in some other library or in somebody's house as if they're accurate information. And so it means getting rid of them in a way that people aren't going to take them. Um, so some, you know, there are a lot of different processes for, for what's called deaccession taking the book out of the collection. Um, sometimes it involves taking the book covers off and then recycling the paper. That was my my usual approach, and that's what that's what we do too. Um, we we can recycle the the pages in there. You can't recycle the book binding itself, so you take the book out of the binding. Um, you know, we as a public library with a bookstore, we actually have a full building next door that is a bookstore. Um, and what we try to do is go ahead and give some, um, give a lot of our books over there. Um, but like Christy said, you have some nonfiction at my last library. We had, we found a nonfiction book from 1964 and it was still on the shelf and I just picked it up and I went in my office and I, <laughs> and I threw it out. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, I think a lot of times people will understand as long as it's not something like that is blown up in the media. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of times people do understand that the library does need to get rid of books from time to time. Yeah. Yeah. We love books, but we also want to make sure that those books are the, are, are accurate, current, mm -hmm. um, inclusive and um, affirming titles. And you want to make sure that they're not, um, that they're not really beat up because yeah, if yeah. Kid is taking out a book for the first time and they get a book that is just really just a mess. Is that a good impression for them to come back? Probably not. And those are some of the things that, you know, I have said to patrons before when we're reading the collection and they see a book on, on a table going, well, why is this going out? And a lot of times it's not so much controversial. It's just more of, oh, well, that cover's falling off. <laughs> I'm going to buy a new one. Or, you know, don't even have to say whether you're buying a new one or not. You know, we had a, a Doc McStuffins book the other day that's falling apart. And we were like, well, we're going to throw this one out. That one's not available. But you know what? Doc has a bunch of other books. So we bought a different one. So, you know, like there's a lot of those decisions. And a lot of times patrons are pretty understanding unless, like I said, it's blown up in the media and then it becomes a little thornier. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think at this point, we um, want to open it up to hear what questions and comments people have mm -hmm. for us. I saw one uh, after I had spoken asking what happened to outreach during, um, during the pandemic. And for a lot of us, it became virtual outreach. Um, I'm still trying to get back into the schools. <laughs> so uh, I think we're all in that same position. Um, what happened during the pandemic and what's still happening is that we've just had to be really, really um, persistent in our outreach and reminding people that we are here. Um, there's all the kind of tech problems, you know, of trying to get on Zoom or do you do Google Meet and, um, but, you know, we made it all work. And a lot of times Kim helped me make it work because it would be, you know, my library wasn't a Google library. Um, so she had to make sure I could actually participate in Google Meets. So, um, you know, it just became very virtual. And I think we're all, right now we're in, in between. You know, we're a little virtual, we're a little in-person, we're masked and, you know, we're getting there. 
I think one of the positive things, though, that came out of this idea of being virtual um, is that a lot of public libraries opened up their programming so that it wasn't just people in their community. If they were doing a guest speaker program and having somebody, um, for example, the other night, I watched a thing on um, Mount Washington and the worst, well, you know, the, is it the worst weather in, in the world? And um, it was really, really interesting. You know, um, I. Uh, um, a meteorologist from there uh, giving his information. And there were people from all over that were able to join that. So in some ways, you know, um, as instructional partners, libraries, public libraries in particular, have been able to expand due to the fact that they're not just doing in-person programs. So it's opening things up for more of an audience. Yeah. And is it the worst weather in the world? What did you learn? <laughs> <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but now I need to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, the the uh, highest wind speed that was ever recorded was there, but um, they're actually um, the Mount Washington Weather Station is actually working with people who are um, working on putting up uh, a wind speed instrument uh, at the top of Mount Everest. Oh, so, cool! Yeah, so very very cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. that was pre-recorded. Uh, you should be able to um, view that um, after the session is over. I can, you know, um, yeah. Tweet that yeah. Out so the mm -hmm. people can see that. I wanted to go to the um, the question about: uh, Are there any programs in school districts for teachers to connect with librarians and know how they can help them? And um, I would say that that is very specific to the district. Um, in Massachusetts, we have a system where basically every town has its own school district, um, whereas when I grew up in California and the districts were many towns together um, and every state and every country is slightly different in how they organize schools group together into a district. And so the same is true for how supportive they are of, of school librarians. And I think that a lot of it goes to the superintendent and whether or not the superintendent, the, the person who's overseeing the whole district, whether or not they understand the impact of, a, of school librarians. Um, because if they do, then they will make sure that there's funding for certified school librarians in each school. Um, you know, here in Massachusetts, we don't have a requirement that there's a school librarian in every school. And so a lot of districts only have them in high school or in middle school, um, not in the elementary schools. And um, it, it takes a lot of effort to convince the people who are spending the money that it's worthwhile spending money on librarians. Um, so again, I say, you know, if you know your administrators, if you have the ability to communicate with them, share that, share this, this um, um, recording, share the resources about the impact of school librarians on student achievement um, and advocate for having those instructional partners in your schools. Um, I saw the question from Adriana about, um, you know, how do we how do we encourage um, faculty to bring their students to the library? And one of the big things, how do I encourage the faculty to bring their students during a lesson or give me class time? And I think um, one of the biggest things that uh, um, was really emphasized in the Google for for Education Certified Coach Program was the idea of building relationships. And I think that's true with librarians is that you have to build those relationships with teachers. And, you know, if you help someone informally, you know, if you kind of act like a, a fly on the wall, if you happen to hear a teacher talking about, oh, you know, I have this lesson coming up, I don't know how I'm going to do this, blah, 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 you know, um, you can kind of insert yourself in there and say, you know, oh, you know, I, I don't, I don't mean to eavesdrop, but I happen to hear you, you know, saying that you're doing this. I would love to help you with that. And um, you know, in my um, media center, I, if I'm working with a teacher, I will create a page on my website specifically for that teacher and for that particular class or lesson. And so I will show other educators and say, you know, here's an example of what we can do together. You know, and we will meet and discuss, and you know. Um, like Christy was saying, you know, being part of that pre-planning process. And uh, when you have that opportunity, awesome. You know, even when you don't though, just the idea of, you know, being able to, you know, help students and teachers find where those resources can, you know, are located, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Do we have any, Rada, do we have any other questions? We have another questions. Okay. Uh, here from Rajma. We have this. Absolutely. Um, we, so my organization, um, uh, um, as a, a statewide support organization, we do a lot of professional development for librarians, but I found that a lot of what we do for librarians has been of interest and impact for uh, classroom teachers as well. And, um, you know, uh, as an aside to that, um, I've, I know of um, a number of um, public librarians and also school librarians who give professional development for classroom teachers so that the classroom teachers are, are building their skills. But then they also, the, the positive byproduct of that is that they also learn how important the librarians can be and how helpful they can be. So, you know, if you are a librarian watching this or you know a librarian, encourage them to, to go and offer their um, assistance and giving professional development for classroom teachers. And then if you are a classroom teacher and you're looking for professional development, you can ask, you know, maybe ask mm -hmm. a librarian that you know and see if they can coordinate doing a session on teaching how to use databases. Or, you know, if you're a, a Google educator, uh, then teaching them how to use Google more effectively so that they can help their students use Google more effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kim and I had done, um, I think we've done at least two sessions together for uh, professional development days. And um, I was always so excited to be able to be in there as an instructor for teachers uh, to show them what, not only what we can do together, but just what is out there for them. A lot of times, if you don't live in your community that you're teaching in, you can still get a public library card. Um, so we would go in and give out cards, but also teach things um, of how what resources were available. So um, that's always out there. And like Christy said, you know, if anyone came up to me and said, hey, you know, in this town, can we have you for professional development? I, I would be saying yes before the question had even finished answering. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. They're really great questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, let me see. Okay. Uh, apparently, we don't have any other question here. So I saw uh, some uh, resources there. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. So we do have um, the, we did share our slide deck, and hopefully um, that link will be um, listed with um, the YouTube video. But all of these are. Um, resources that we used in, um, or that we quoted, uh, many of which are kind of um, co uh, collation of other studies, um, or they are the standards that Kim talked about. And then. Yeah, and then um, we also gathered um, just a few um, things from library Twitter. So if you wanna learn more about, you know, what librarians are doing, um, you know, those voices that are advocating for the profession. Um, these are some great Twitter handles to follow. There's also um, people on that list that have done research on um, school libraries and their impact. So yeah, definitely uh, check check those out on Twitter. Yeah. And this is how you can reach out to us. Mm -hmm. Um, our emails and um, we all are on different social media platforms, which we was on our, our original slide um, on Twitter, Instagram. Most I'm on mis Instagram mostly uh, these days. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, <laughs> um, but we would love to have you all uh, interact with us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. It yeah. It has been a really great presentation. Mm -hmm. As I expected, I have learned a lot more from your work and I admire you because there's there's a lot to learn and we have to collaborate with our librarians because we are a team and in our schools we don't know how marvelous can you be when you work with us. So I'm really, really amazed about you and I'm really happy for being for, for being here to join and learn from you. Really, really great session. And all audience, uh, 
I think that agree with me because we have learned a lot and gained a lot of resources. So thank you very much. Uh, you. We are sharing the resources uh, with you. And um, please give us the opportunity to join with us again, because I think that this topic, it's really interesting for our audience. So happy to see you and happy to see every, everybody in the audience and give us your feedback. Please remember that all the presentations are on our YouTube channel and you can see, you can watch them later. And we hope you have enjoyed your presentation. I look uh, very happy for you three. And I am so happy to be here with you. And thank you. Thank yes, you so much. Thank you. Anything else you have to say no, bye? No, yeah, just good. thank you to yeah, um, thanks. Global Gig for uh, hosting us. Uh, we really appreciate uh, having the opportunity to, you know, share our message with um, all of the people from Global Gig. So thank you. Yeah. And thank you thank for you so being much. our host. You're welcome here, and we hope you will be back soon. All right. Um, thanks. Great. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thanks thank for you. all our values, and don't forget, we always be keep learning. Have a good day and good to see you. Bye.